change. All things must change. From distant galaxies seen through the Hubble telescope to the subatomic world experienced at the Large Hadron Collider near Geneva, Switzerland. All things change. God is the only constant in all time and space. The fruit bearing cycle envisioned by Jesus Christ has at its core the need for change. Should the vine symbol used by Jesus to describe this need for change and growth, then we should see this principle in other areas of Scripture. The book of Job is a classic example of the fruit-bearing cycle in operation. It is so important we remember that fruitfulness is not a product produced, but a process endured. The book of Job is the poster child of a man who endured much pain and suffering for his God. Why did Job suffer so much? In this episode, we will explore the life of Job and look for clues that will help answer this question. In the land of Uz, there lived a man whose name was Job. This man was blameless and upright. He feared God and shunned evil. He had seven sons and three daughters, and he owned 7,000 sheep, 3,000 camels, 500 yoke of oxen, and 500 donkeys, and had a large number of servants. He was the greatest man among all the people of the East. His sons used to take turns holding feasts in their homes, and they would invite their three sisters to eat and drink with them. When a period of feasting had run its course, Job would send and have them purified. Early in the morning, he would sacrifice a burnt offering for each of them, thinking, Perhaps my children have sinned and cursed God in their hearts. This was Job's regular custom. The book of Job is introduced with the declaration that he was the wealthiest man in the Middle East, and he was a man who was blameless and feared God. Job's sons would take turns holding feasts for family and friends. But after the feast, Job would offer burnt offerings for all the members of his family. Job continually did this ritual because he feared the possibility that his sons would curse God in a drunken state. From this introduction, we can ascertain certain facts concerning Job. Job feared God's judgment, but he was ignorant of his person. Job was terrorized by the possibility that God would destroy him. He feared God, but did he truly know God? Job only knew God as a destroyer who would blow away his wealth with a blast from his nostrils. This was the revelation of God. Job understood. Job's own words confirm this theory. Job said, For I dreaded destruction from God, and for fear of his splendor, I could not do such things. What I feared has come upon me. What I dreaded has happened to me. 
So we leave this opening scene with the insight that Job feared God as an almighty destroyer, but he did not know God as a loving father. This one question echoes in my mind. Why would God destroy Job and his family? This action would only reinforce Job's perception. One day, the angels came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan also came with them. The Lord said to Satan, where have you come from? Satan answered the Lord, From roaming through the earth and going back and forth in it. Then the Lord said to Satan, Have you considered my servant Job? There is no one on earth like him. He is blameless and upright, a man who fears God and shuns evil. Does Job fear God for nothing? Satan replied, have you not put a hedge around him and his household and everything he has? You have blessed the work of his hands so that his flocks and herds are spread throughout the land. But stretch out your hand and strike everything he has and he will surely curse you to your face. The Lord said to Satan, Very well then, everything he has is in your hands but on the man himself do not lay a finger. Then Satan went out from the presence of the Lord. This area of scripture is confusing. Why would God be so easily manipulated by Satan to allow Job's destruction? No father would allow an enemy to attack his child only to prove to that enemy that his child loves him. Is God that easily manipulated by Satan? If God is that easily manipulated, then we should fear Satan more than him. God must have had a reason for allowing Satan to attack Job. What could the reason be? Put Job's difficulties in the light of God's fruit-bearing cycle. It is important we recall the perception Job had of God. Did Job see God in the light of love and mercy? The answer would be no. Job only saw God as a destroyer and this faulty perception was the only crack in Job that Satan could exploit. What is the mission and purpose of Satan? The book of Job and the epistle of Peter gives clarity to this question. Satan is doomed to wander the earth, seeking whom he may devour. This is somewhat of a vague statement, but consider this thought. Satan's mission is the sentence of God on Lucifer for his rebellion. God condemned Lucifer to wander throughout the earth, seeking for his seeds of rebellion and deception. With this judgment, Lucifer became Satan, the accuser. During Satan's wanderings, Job became known to him because of his right standing with God. Upon closer inspection from Satan, Job's weakness became known. Job feared that God would destroy his wealth as a judgment for sin. Satan found a crack in Job's faith, and that crack was fear. 
One thing the New Testament makes clear, Satan can have a place in our lives only to the degree we give him that foothold. Job had another problem that this whole disastrous event exposed. Deep within his faith was a root of religious pride. During the painful intercession Job had with his three friends, he makes a statement that on the surface is filled with faith and hope. But is it? Though he slay me, yet will I hope in him. I will surely defend my ways to his face. Indeed, this will turn out for my deliverance for no godless man would dare come before him. Job's declaration of faith is rooted more in religious pride than in true relationship with God. Job was so proud of his religious walk that he would even defend his ways to God himself. Let me summarize what Job just said. God, I have memorized all the latest Vogue doctrines concerning you. I have continually offered sacrifice in accordance with these doctrines. My ways are perfect. Why did you destroy me? Consider the religious arrogance of such a statement. How does God perceive the ways of men? There is none righteous. No, not one. There is none that can stand before God on their own merit. God hates the arrogance of man that would stand before him in his own righteousness. God understands that none seek after him. All human flesh has sinned. There is none that do good. No, not even one. Even though God saw in Job trust and fear, still Job was a man of sin. Job's insistence to maintain his own ways before God reeked of religious pride. Pride is the cancer that spoils the fruit of righteousness. God wanted a deeper relationship with Job. Therefore, God crucified his pride. God used a winter season in Job's life to prune his vain religious doctrines and pride. God wanted a deeper relationship with Job, but he needed to break Job's pride and fear. God also needed to change Job's doctrinal perception of him. Toward the end of Job's winter season, he was broken in spirit and pride. In desperation, Job sought the face of God. But God was distant and far away. Job felt the heavens were brass, and God turned his face from him. God was silent to Job, and this winter season was bitter cold. As to the length of Job's winter season, the scriptures are silent. But finally, God appears to Job to challenge his religious pride and faulty perception. Job shudders and falls before the glorious presence of God. All the religious education Job had did not prepare him 
for the true experience of standing in the presence of God. The light of God so penetrated Job that he saw himself through the eyes of God and he wept bitter tears. Job makes the following cry of repentance to God. My ears have heard of you, but now my eyes have seen you. Therefore, I despise myself and repent in dust and ashes. A spiritual spring now dawns in the life of Job, and a new revelation of God floods his heart. Before this experience, Job only understood God from the doctrines he had been taught through the hearing of the ear. But when Job saw God, he repented in dust and ashes because he had now seen God with his eyes. Job entered a new revelation and a new season of fruit bearing had come. Job experienced a deeper relationship with God based on true experience, not doctrinal debate and dogma. What did God get? from the horror of Satan's pruning. He got a new Job, with a new perception of him, based on love and truth, not fear. God also acquired another fruit from Job. Let's read. And the Lord turned the captivity of Job when he prayed for his friends. Also the Lord gave Job twice as much as he had before. Job became a minister of God based on a true perception of his divine nature. God released Job from his winter season and he became a servant and prayed for his friends. Remember, a major key to the fruit-bearing cycle is the servant attitude. When Job became a servant to his friends, God gave him a double blessing. The Lord blessed the latter part of Job's life more than the first, and so he died old and full of years. To what degree did Job's encounter with God change him? To answer this question, we again return to the last verses of the book of Job. Nowhere in all the land were there found women as beautiful as Job's daughters, and their father granted them an inheritance along with their brothers. Job gave his daughters an inheritance along with their brothers. On the surface, this action does not seem unusual. But according to the Semitic culture from this time period, daughters had no inheritance along with sons. Only the male descendants could receive an inheritance, not female descendants. What happened to cause such a major change in Job that would motivate him to violate the religious customs of his day? Job saw God, and the light of God changed him forever. Relationship will always triumph over religion. Before we come to our hurting friends with our wise counsel, like Job's friends. Consider this thought. We are not all in the same season of fruit bearing.